It's great to see so many of you still here. I know that schedules sometimes uh, require us to take leave early, even when we have saved uh, one of the best treats to the last. So, Dan Cohen is known by many of us, um, and I just wanted to say a few words, uh, many of which have already been included in the program, but I think they really bear repetition. It strikes me that Dan is an American historian. All right. <laughs> it doesn't really. <laughs> that the reason I begin with that comment that Dan is an American historian is that he comes out of scholarship. He does not come fully formed in some other fashion uh, as a technologist, as a dreamer, but as a practitioner. A scholar, a leader, who has combined his historical training with developing creative yet highly practical approaches and applications that have enabled him and all of us to explore and expand the capacities of digital scholarship. We owe you a great gratitude, Dan. In his time at the Center for History and New Media, Dan worked with others to pioneer projects like Zotero, the open source citation management tool, Omeka, the open source platform for digital exhibits. He and his team developed important digital collections, including the September 11th Digital Archive, which was one of the first born digital collections, and notably, the very first digital collection acquired by Library of Congress. As executive director of the DPLA, Dan helped establish, and I should say realize, the vision and the foundation that would enable democratized global access to our nation's cultural heritage as represented through a combination of America's libraries, archives, and museums. As if that weren't enough, in June this year, Dan was appointed as the vice provost for Information Collaboration, Dean of Libraries, and Professor of History at Northeastern University. With his body of work that has focused on the impact of digital media and technology on all aspects of knowledge and learning, including the nature of libraries and their evolving resources, to 21st century research techniques and software tools, to the changing landscape of communication and pub publication. Dan has directed major initiatives that have shaped and will continue to shape our future. Please join me in welcoming Dan Cohen. Thank you. Uh, that, was, that was a very kind introduction. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, conferences should get more informal as they go on. So I am going to try to talk just for a little bit, and I'd love to have an interactive dialogue with you. And um, I'm faced with this very daunting topic of institutionalizing digital scholarship. And, you know, institutions are difficult things to build. Um, I, I feel I have been very lucky to be a small part of several of them. Um, I'll talk in depth about one of them and maybe talk about the other two in a little bit less depth. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all the other stuff that we probably haven't discussed um, this week. It is about people. It is about psychology. It is about sociology and politics and economics um, and business. Uh, you know, if you are going to institutionalize something, you are tackling 
all of the things, as I like to say, that I did not learn in graduate school <laughs> studying history. Um, I've just picked them up on the job, and I hope that I can at least um, provide some hints of, of what I've learned along this journey. Um, but I think the best thing that I can do is, is tell you some stories, um, to be a historian about this, because if you are going to institutionalize digital scholarship at your institution, it will be your specific story. There, I don't believe that there is one template, just as there, as Joan has shown, there's not one exact template for what a digital scholarship lab will look like. It will be configured to the needs of your institution. It will have to be matched in some ways with all of that, the politics and the economics and the, the weird little peculiarities that all of us have at our institutions. It's, it's just necessary as part of institutionalizing digital scholarship. So um, this is a rather <laughs> expansive topic and uh, a daunting one. Um, and one also that I think uh, can't happen with the snap of a finger. Um, it, it's just going to be something that you will push at at your institution over time and get small accretions of victories and projects and people and funding to get to a point where only perhaps in retrospect, you can feel that you have institutionalized what you are going for. So let me start with a little history. This is uh, Roy Rosenzweig. He was a social historian of America. Um, he was really interested in uncovering uh, the stories of the working class that had not been recorded in books or government records. Um, and this is him when he's 30 years old, uh, when he joined the faculty at George Mason University, um, the first thing he asked for was a computer. And he asked for that not to do word processing, but because he was a genius and he had incredible foresight and he realized that these new devices would in fact really impact the practice of history. And they would do them not in becoming a fancy typewriter, but they would become an important part of digital scholarship, would become an important part of history. In that, for instance, he started putting oral histories that he was recording into a database on his computer in 1984. Um, you know, when he passed away in 2007 and we went into his basement and, and dug up all the stuff, we, we found records of him doing things that I'm still trying to do uh, 33 years later. He was already thinking about that in the early 80s and what this could do. He went on um, a decade later, but note that it was a whole decade later um, after doing some traditional scholarship to producing the first uh, CD-ROM with history on it called Who Built America? Um, and um, so he's 40 now and he has done a lot of teaching and traditional scholarship, but also constantly with the eye on what can this new medium do? Um, what, what are its affordances? What can it do for me? What can it do for our department? What can it do for um, our profession? When I was a graduate student at Yale in the early 90s, I didn't even know Roy then. I had to look back at the program. He came uh, with several others to give a conference on hypertext um, that uh, it was remarkable for the early 90s to sort of talk about this stuff. But he was constantly thinking every day, waking up, thinking, what does this technology mean? But what does it mean in the service of scholarship and what I've always done, which is a passion for democratizing access to history, democratizing the historical record, using digital media and technology to analyze what I've got and to create new things out of that. And this is one of those things that he created with several others. Um, who, who Built America CD-ROM. Um, it was sold with Apple computers for a while. It sold 100,000 copies, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, and um, another good lesson that I learned from Roy about this time, and so this is the mid-90s, is just how hard it is actually to bring this new stuff into institutions like universities, which are small c conservative in many ways. Um, I don't wanna get into tenure and promotion and all that stuff, but I will note that, that um, he had at this point gotten tenure 
and was doing this, but he was worried about how this digital scholarship would be perceived by his colleagues and by his profession. Um, the, the great story that some of you may have heard me t tell before about this moment was um, he was working really hard on Who Built America and um, had a long day at his computer. You can, you can see there, I think it was a Mac Performa um, for historians of Apple computers, and um, had a, a long day and was sort of wondering, you know, should I write a, a book instead? What am I doing, like creating this weird disk format? And, uh, you know, can I put it into my promotion package? Anyway, he finished the day and he went to the gym and he got on a treadmill and the TV above the treadmill was showing Entertainment Tonight. And so he was on the treadmill and he's looking up and Mary Hart is interviewing Fabio, who is fresh off of the success of his I Can't Believe It's Not Butter advertising campaign. <laughs> And so Roy is watching this. Um, he liked bad TV as a kind of, you know, yin yang with his deep scholarship. And he's watching this and Mary Hart at the end says, so Fabio, what are you working on next? And Fabio looks into the camera and he says, well, Mary, I'm working on an interactive CD-ROM. <laughs> and Roy went home that night saying, I am working on a form of digital scholarship that Fabio is also working on. <laughs> and how am I going to explain this to everyone else? Yeah. So there are those difficult moments. I think everybody in this room has had that where they've created digital projects. And I mean, even recently in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there was a disparaging article about digital humanities saying, you know, it, 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 it is an interactive CD-ROM by Fabio. Essentially, that's what it's saying. It's shallow epistemologically. It uses, um, you know, formats that aren't up to snuff um, in a scholarly way. So institutionalizing means, and I will come back to this, means normalizing some of these things and making them more regular and acceptable. And that is, again, a, an exercise in politics and social psychology and collaboration and advocacy and articulation. Right after he created the CD-ROM, he set up a website and he put up a sign on his door declaring that One Roy Rosenzweig was now the Center for History and New Media. Um, always a good move if you want to institutionalize something is you make a center, that's just you. Um, and he had a Mac SE30 that was overheating in the bottom of his closet and suddenly he had a center. This was before the, everyone named everything digital, so I love that and it's still today the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, um, in which he started to put up some projects that now he had the affordances of the web. This was amazing. He didn't need the CD-ROM, he didn't need this physical disc. He could distribute this digital history. And so he forged along. He um, uh, uh, was able to get a half-time webmaster, the first hire for the Center for History and New Media. And then in the late 90s, he hired a couple people, one of them being me. And so we had three and a half people. And that was where we were around um, 2000. Um, we kept thinking of new projects together, and they moved, we moved out of Roy's um, office into what we called the van in the parking lot, which was one of these modular units that you have if you're a state university and you can't afford building more. You rent a little unit and you stick it in the parking lot with a, with a ramp going up to it. And we had a Linux server at that point that was in a closet that was also overheating, and we had a fiber optic cable that came in through the roof that would often get cut when uh, tall trucks went by and snipped it. <laughs> so we were there for a while, the, the few of us, um, but started because there were more people there, they had more interests. I had an interest in software tools. I had worked as a computer programmer during graduate school to help pay my way through Yale. And um, so I was interested in sort of what new tools we could build out of that. Um, we had someone come on, Kelly Shrum, who was really interested in pedagogy and digital pedagogy, and she started I mean, this is in the same way that Roy put a sticker on his door saying he was a center for history and new media. I declared myself director of research and software, or some fancy title, and Kelly declared herself um, uh, head of the division of education in the center for history and new media. And we had no employees at that point, but we did have a very, very cozy um, van in the parking lot. 
um, which then got raccoons um, in its, <laughs> in its uh, lower portion. It was warm there because of our Linux server. And so we had raccoons come in, and the raccoons had fleas on them. Um, and then the fleas came up into our space. And so we had what we called the Christo moment of CHM, where our entire uh, building was wrapped in a blue fabric um, and fumigated for 48 hours. Institutionalizing. This is it happening right here. Um, so all the fleas died. It was really gross, um, but we, we kept growing. And again, we did that because other people were interested in what we were doing, and we accreted slowly several projects. So we formalized divisions. We had teaching and learning, um, which Kelly ran, research and tools um, that I ended up running and collecting and exhibiting. We had a, a, a unit of public projects. And so we had gone from three and a half people to 10 people to 20 people just over these years, over about a half dozen years. Um, and so it was out of just um, thinking about many things that we wanted to do and having different people involved that we, we slowly built up. When you go to the Center for History and New Media site, you see all these projects. All of those were hard, hard fought, hard won exercises, but that fit together and that also fit again within Roy's original vision for what the center should be and do. Um, and we, we tried to stay within that. If you look over these projects, um, you know, it's very, it's eclectic. It's opportunistic. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to say we were proud of all of them, but maybe there were a couple in there that were, you know, a little more eclectic than they should have been or a little mercenary because we maybe had a funder um, who was really interested in an area that we, we thought, yeah, like we could, we could do that and that would help to support some of our staff for a little while. That's okay too. There was a kind of ruthless pragmatism to this. And it was at this time um, that we also had a, a whiteboard in the center um, that just was an ideas board that we kept up all the time. And it just, we just jot down ideas. Um, Tom Scheinfeld, who now runs Greenhouse Studios, I think there's some folks here from UConn, um, you know, put up um, roadway markers. He was really interested in roadway markers. Hey, maybe if we digitize those, and then um, it was the early age of the cell phone, but not yet the smartphone, but Tom had already seen like, well, actually you, you can kind of find where you are with your cell phone and maybe we could use wireless messaging to send those, um, those road signs to someone in a passing car. We'd, we'd constantly been thinking of them. Zotero came completely out of that. We hated EndNote with a passion, um, and that was one thing, but that's not a project, hating another software project with a passion. Um, what that came out of was we had a, a, a FileMaker database uh, project called um, Scribe, that was a sort of EndNote clone that Elena Rose Logova from Concordia created on her own. She was at that halftime webmaster at the beginning. Um, but I was looking very carefully at uh, web browsers and the changes in web browsers and noticed that um, the initial version of Firefox, so as Firefox kind of spun out from an earlier version that was Mozilla's um, browser that was much heavier weight. They created this new Firefox thing. And in version two of that, um, lo and behold, there was a database underneath the web browser for the first time. And I said, wow, it'd be really neat if we could surf around and then use that database to store citations. It's right there. Nobody's using it. And so we thought that through. But this was an, you know, a year, two years before we figured out what we could do and to start get the funding on it. It was up there on the whiteboard. We, we think we can do something where you can surf the web and auto-identify scholarly objects in the web browser and then store them in a hidden database that just happened to exist because someone at Firefox thought it would be a good idea to include a database um, with a web browser. Grew and grew just out of that, again, slowly. Um, when I left, there were roughly 60 people um, involved in the center in one capacity or another. We started to have graduate students work there. We had the provost um, allocated a number of um, grad um, research assistantships 
to their, um, we had hard money, we had soft money. None of this was easy. This was all a slow accretion um, over time. So the message, and this is their latest homepage, it's still Roy's original message, which he was thinking about 30, 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. Same thing. It's just gone through multiple iterations. It's been instantiated in different projects by different people. Over 200 people have now worked at CHM. Some of them, I don't know, maybe in this room, um, uh, but they're scattered all over, and I want to I want to come back to that at the end. Um, but it still has the vision. It just took a long, long time to get there. Um, so. Um, of course, there are just really easy lessons from all of this. Um, you know, find a genius, right? In this case, Roy, <laughs> add raccoons and fleas. Okay, so you get my, my point here. I, mean, I don't mean to be facetious, but this was, this was hard work. It was over time. It involved all these different elements um, to do. So I, I, when, I, when people ask me sort of what the lessons of the Center for History and New Media are, um, you know, it's tough to just lay them out and say this is, this is, these are replicable conditions for you to institutionalize your own digital scholarship. I think instead um, we need to ask questions. So first one that I would encourage you to think about are what your natural strengths are. What are the strengths that you and your colleagues and your potential partners have? Um, I think it's a mistake to do everything. And we were certainly asked. We were the Center for History and New Media at George Mason. You can bet that as we became more and more successful, there were other entities on campus that wanted to get involved. And, and there's a lot of digital scholarship centers, obviously, that are more literature oriented or um, religious studies or philosophy or other humanities, social sciences. Um, that's just not what, where we were. We, we felt we had natural strengths we, we had hoarded every PhD in history who had also been a programmer as a kid. That, that, that we had cornered the market on that by 2005. And so we had natural strengths um, in that area. Um, at Northeastern, we are super lucky to have Julia and, and so many talented colleagues who have great strengths in areas that I do not have strengths in. So TEI, um, uh, they have fantastic background in TEI, um, teaching it, using it in projects, using it in texts, encoding things, um, so we can clearly have a strength there. Um, Northeastern's uh, library also has a passion about the neighborhood around us. We have a mission in our archive to try to capture um, the stories and the documents of our immediate neighborhood in we are physically located in Boston, right on the Roxbury line. Um, and so um, we've had a natural strength there. We already had materials in the archive um, to work with. Second, what is the nature of your institution? I think is a really big question. Um, you know, I know that there are universities that are just generalists, but usually, Universities have a particular skew to them and a way that they operate and just even structurally the schools that they have or don't have. Um, so what is the nature of your institution? For Northeastern, it's been very different than the two other universities I've been at, Yale and um, I got my PhD and I had been at other universities before that for earlier degrees, um, but for a long time, Yale and George Mason University, those are very different institutions. Northeastern's very different than in those institutions. Um, so what's the nature of your institution? At Northeastern, when I got there, we are really emphasizing experiential learning. We have had forever a co-op program where all of our undergraduates and soon all of our master students and PhD students go out into the field, every single one of them to have six months of work on a co-op, actually they do undergrads do that twice or even sometimes three times, where they experience what it's like to use their knowledge outside of the classroom and then they bring that back into the classroom and that's been our signature. Um, that's not a very Yale thing and that's not to disparage Yale. It's not a very George Mason thing um, either. Um, but that's the nature of Northeastern. Um, there are other emphases that I could go into, but I'll just name that one. And I, I think everyone in this room should be able to 
think about their institution and say, you know, well, what are we, what do we do? What do we like? What's the faculty like? What are the interests that are there? And to see how you can match that up. I think it's practical. It's frankly, it's also political. You are going to have to sell this interesting new institution within your institution and say how it fits into the larger structure. So again, we have, we have a Lower Roxbury Black History Project where we work with the community at Northeastern, um, nearby Northeastern to record oral histories. That's been a strength. We've recently acquired some major archives relating to Boston, some of which I, I can, cannot talk about right now because they haven't been announced, but we've had a very specific um, collecting focus and we wanted to just enhance that. Um, we also have um, tremendous uh, strength in digital humanities and computational social sciences. So we have a number of people in the history department and in English literature and in the social sciences, political science. Um, we have a number of people doing um, network analysis. We have a huge network science group um, on campus. So there's a great core, and it's one of the things that really drew me to Northeastern. There's just a great core there of people who are interested in digital humanities, computational social sciences, the use of data, data visualization, et cetera. And in turn, in the library, we actually have two uh, full-time data visualization people who will help to, um, you know, even if someone does, doesn't consider that they're doing digital scholarship projects, they will still, those people will help them to visualize whatever uh, they are working on. And of course, we have the strength of the digital scholarship group for major projects. Um, uh, of many different kinds um, that I'm sure um, Julia has discussed here. So we have those things. Third, what opportunities do you have? Um, I'm always keeping my ears open for opportunities and here I'll, I'll shift gears a little bit to DPLA. Um, DPLA, Digital Public Library of America, was a highly collaborative nationwide project, very unwieldy in some respects, um, but it, and the entire staff at this point is still only about 15 people. Um, and it's millions and millions of digitized items that we're blending together. It's got a very complicated technical infrastructure. And so what opportunities do we have? I need partners. I need people to help us out and frankly to provide in-kind labor, but also to think along with us of how we do something with, with frankly a fairly lightweight organization. So what opportunities are out there? What different kinds of funders are out there? Um, so being opportunistic, again, going back to the CHM whiteboard, here's some things we wanna do. Can we match those up with opportunities, whether they're funded or not? Always trying to, to balance those things out so you can get another notch in toward where you're, you want to go. So beyond those questions that I always ask, uh, people when I, when I visit a new campus and I'm maybe talking about digital scholarship groups, whether they're in libraries or independent like the Center for History and New Media, um, I always like to end with, with some thoughts about what institutionalizing means at the, at the end. And again, oftentimes it's only in retrospect that you recognize, wow, we actually got this thing here and it seems fairly permanent. Um, so, um, one is, is that it's routinizing. You've, you've routinized things. So it's at the beginning, you will, you will inevitably end up with just little special projects because you have to start somewhere and you'll do one or two or three things. You'll have a specific faculty member or you'll have a um, specific inner driven library project, what have you. Those will be one-off projects, and, and that's okay. That's where you have to start. But institutionalizing it means routinizing it. So um, Harriet mentioned Omeka. We built Omeka in part for others, but actually in large part for ourselves at the Center for History and New Media, because once we got past one online exhibit and then two online exhibits and then three online exhibits, we realized we should stop doing these hand-coded projects for each person and uh, partner. So we needed to generalize the software into a package that was easy to use, that we could replicate, that we could give to others, that they could replicate it, um, and make it routine. 
at Northeastern, we're doing this. We have a series toolkit, C-E-R-E-S, you can Google it, a toolkit that leverages a specific platform that has specific affordances that allows us to routinize the project. That doesn't mean that they're not, they're inflexible or that you can't, you know, skin them in wonderful new designs and CSS. You, yes, you still can do that, but there, you may have to mix in some inflexibility so that you can um, replicate things more quickly and so that you can keep these things alive because Every single project that you do individually will be a pain in the butt to, to um, update for browser 57 in 2027. You will hate yourself for having um, done it for a very specific reason. So routinization is part of institutionalization. Um, yes, you can still have great new projects that break boundaries and are innovative, but I think if you wanna institutionalize, you've got to routinize. You also have to normalize the fact that you exist on campus. And again, this is the political and social psychological portion of my talk. So um, you have to make it normal that people on your campus do digital scholarship. And again, there are lots of forces arrayed against that. I will tell you personally, I'm not sure I've ever actually mentioned this, but um, Roy and I wrote a book called Digital History. It was never reviewed by the American Historical Association. We were surprised. We were like, hey, we just wrote a book called Digital History on this new thing. And we sent it into the American Historical Review and they're like, I don't know, not really. <laughs> not really, it looks like a guidebook or maybe it's like a handbook maybe. We said, yeah, but there's some intellectual work in there about you know, what it means to go digital and we talk about the, this new media and what am I, mm, no. Not worth reviewing. Um, yeah, I still, I still hurt from that. No, I, do, I really don't. Um, yes, my, my middle age, uh, middle school age children, as they, as they say to me, as they repeat every morning, they have a, a saying uh, in their middle school, let it go, let it go. <laughs> move, move on and let it go. So I have moved on, long time ago. But I do bring it up just because I think it's an interesting data point that there are, um, it's tough. I mean, it's tough to normalize this stuff. And what it requires is for you to do outreach and to um, get allies who understand what you're doing. A lot of my um, work at the, in the last five years or so at George Mason was just normalizing this stuff on campus. We then started having a lot of assistant professors who would come up for tenure with big digital projects. They may have also had a monograph. Um, but I didn't want them to be like me where I came up for tenure having you know, written a regular old book, um, but also having all these digital projects and having to explain myself that, well, you know, I think this stuff is as important as that stuff. Right? So normalizing it is, is a very, I think, complicated process. And, and you really want everyone on campus, again, if you were truly institutionalized, to sort of say, ah, oh, there's that amazing center in the library. I can go there to do a big project, but maybe I'll go there to just get a little visualization or learn about some new piece of software. It's got to occur to everyone. And that is a marketing exercise. It is not necessarily all the other stuff. And then ultimately, you need to depersonalize. <laughs> um, so, and this will, in a sense, just to come full circle. I started with a picture of Roy. Roy is still there. He died very young, unfortunately. Um, but his work was institutionalized. I became director of the center. I then left to go direct DPLA. Someone took over for me. We've had a lot of people come and go at the center. It's still there. So it's not impersonal, but it's, it's moved away from being dependent on a single person or a group of people because people move on. Hopefully they don't die young, but they do move on. And institutionalization means that um, you've gotten past a charismatic uh, genius. And, and um, I'm seeing a lot of knowing nods out there. It really, I've seen a lot of digital humanities labs, digital scholarship labs go down because they relied on one person or two people or on a specific setup 
or a specific provost who really, really liked the idea and then was replaced or retired and then they didn't get the same support. So you've got to figure out a way where these things have longevity. And that is, it's also about continuing to explain your value and the value on campus. Um, and it's also about bringing in and, and in a sense generating new digital scholars into it, right? Because at the Center for History and New Media, we always have you know, the assistant director of research who took over for me and the assistant to the assistant director. And we inculcated a whole group of people in the pipeline. We had a big, big pipeline um, of talented people who were interested in this stuff so that we were replaceable. Ultimately, we could be replaced and the institution would go on and new ideas would be generated. Maybe they were different ideas than the ideas that you have or I have, but the institution would go on. And ultimately, that is the mark of institutionalizing. I'll stop here for questions. Thank you. So I am told, uh, just to remind people, we have Mics, wait, I thought we had mics. Um, we have mics, great. Okay, so um, just because this is, I think, being live streamed or recorded, um, uh, we'll just wanna make sure that we get your question actually on, um, on tape, thanks. Dan, thanks so much, and I'm, um, I'm Monica McCormick from University of Delaware. I am so grateful that you invoked Roy's memory because I revered Roy and loved working with him to the limited extent that I did. But one of the things that I remember thinking about with him was another way of institutionalizing. And I know you spoke about how you started off with CHNM mostly on soft money, but you were in a tenure track job. He hired other people who were, can you talk a little bit about sure. how he made sure people's people's employment was yeah, stable? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, I did not start in a tenure track job. Um, I met Roy like everybody else. He had the world's largest Rolodex for coffee somewhere because um, he was constantly drinking coffee. And he just remembered me, you know, nine months later from coffee um, to because he had gotten a grant in the history of science and he knew I did history, history of science. So I actually joined on soft money as a visiting assistant professor at George Mason. But what Roy did in a very gentle but savvy and also kind of forceful way was he would always try to get a hard shell around the soft money. So I was there for a little while, a couple of years. Um, so 2001, I started 2003. I then was able to nudge over into the tenure track and we slowly did that over time. So if you looked at our balance sheet of hard soft, we went from 80% soft to 50% soft money and um, which is still challenging to raise that money every year. Um, but slowly to build that up, the graduate students was a great example of, it was great labor, we paid them, it wasn't, they weren't interning for free. Um, uh, we got more technical help. So there, was, there were things and also frankly, we brought in revenue. So Zotero is totally self-sustaining on storage revenue at this point. And so we had to think about how to support each and every position. Um, and some of that was from tenure lines. So, um, you know, um, Sean Tackett, um, who now runs Otero, he's a French historian, again, also a programmer, um, got tenure, Kelly Schramm, who directed education, ultimately. But it took time, right? And it took Roy's... Um, you know, great savvy power and status within the university to kind of wrap those things in um, in a shell. Yeah. I guess that's my my thought is that it's not just institutionalizing your organization; it's using the rules of your institution to stabilize your organization. <sighs> yeah. Right. And so you know, it was very hard at George Mason because it was a, just a cash poor place. Um, you know, we also raised an endowment. So there's a $4 million endowment just for the center there that we slowly built up um, through an NEH challenge grant. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it, it, each place will be different. Um, I, I, you know, it, it'd be nice to be at a place that could just plunk a bunch of money down from an existing endowment. Um, on the other hand, I think it made us very scrappy and it made us better at 
the marketing and articulation because our lives depended on it or our employees depended on us being able to do that repeatedly rather than resting on it because we knew we had a five-year funding phase. Yeah, Jen? I'm Jen Riley from McGill University. So you've told us the story about doing this work, being in the trenches, but you're in a different position now. You're a vice provost, campus administrator, right. university librarian. So can you tell us more about your approach to that and how in your sure. role now you want to create the conditions that will allow things like this to actually happen? Uh, that is a great question. Well, I'm still, still learning the ropes um, a bit, um, although I have, again, I'm very fortunate to have incredible uh, colleagues like Julia and Patrick Yacht and many others. Um, I think the new perspective I've gotten as a dean of the libraries is, um, for me, uh, I do not want digital scholarship to be this thing that's over here. I mean, I am really glad we've got the digital scholarship group. and But I want all of our liaisons who are in the more traditional side of the house to recommend people to go over to Julia's group. I don't want it, and Julia's heard me um, talk about this, I want one library, not an analog library and a digital library. I think it's all one library. And so I'm thinking a lot right now with, with my new hat and my vice provostial <laughs> scepter, um, I'm, I'm thinking of how do we all sort of become part of this new world and not have it be so new? Again, normalization. So um, I I'm not done with that <laughs> thinking yet, um, but I think a lot of it is, um, I think a lot of the solution is about having greater interactions across units. I think that libraries, and, and ours is the same way, There's they tend to have very traditional structures. I mean, I have sort of three ADs who, you know, you've got your collections and resources, you know, you've got research and instruction and access services. Patrick runs something called digital strategy, I think it is, and services. Um, but I think it's really at the staff level of having greater interaction with those elements. And so I'm starting to think through how we can encourage that, that kind of work. Um, it's, it is often um, the, the people in the trenches, not the people at my level or at the, the AD level or AUL level. It's the people who are interacting with the engineering department who can realize if their antenna are up, that, hey, we've got someone here who could work with someone in the history department because they're interested in you know, the mechanics of, or the history of coastal erosion, and maybe we could get interdisciplinary work together, and maybe that's the germ of a new project or a new grant. So I'm, I'm just in the process now sort of thinking through, I mean, we have a fairly small in the big scheme of things, we have 75 FTE library. That's enough that everybody knows each other. Um, you know, I worked really hard right at the start just to learn about everybody and their names and what they do. And now I'm in the process, I think, over this year of thinking about how we can get everybody over into this digital scholarship realm where needed. There's still going to be people who are doing analog things, but everybody in the building should be aware that we've got great initiatives, that they can be part of it. Um, and I think, so in a sense, um, you know, I, I don't want Julia's group to dissolve into the rest. She's looking at me with great fear. But to, <laughs> but in a sense, to be better integrated, um, you know? Uh, and, and I think that's always the peril, I think, with a digital scholarship thing is, is people, the other people in the library, you know, if you don't do it right, um, are gonna start a whisper campaign that there's like library 2.0 and they're invading and they got that space, right? And that's, I think, I think that's a peril. Right, and people do, again, small c conservative aspects of universities and libraries. Uh, I've been trying to, or at least beginning to, and, and I think Julia would say I haven't succeeded yet, but thinking about how we're all going over to 2.0. In fact, we're not even gonna call it 2.0 because that's like very 1990s. We're just saying libraries always had traditional mission. Now we've got this new, these new digital methods. We're all gonna understand what those methods are and where necessary, we're gonna advocate for it or help faculty or create our own projects. Um, for instance, we've got some incredible opportunities at Northeastern, I mean, really incredible opportunities around our archives and digital scholarship right now that we're pursuing starting this year. Um, and those are integrative, right? They're taking 
very traditional group, Archives and Special Collections, and we're gonna knit it together with Julia's group, one library. I'm Wayne Morris from Emory University. Enjoyed your talk. I wanted to ask about how important you think the idea of bringing projects out in a public platform is, like public scholarship. Um, I can see how it plays into institutionalizing, but even beyond that, to get funding and things. You know, a lot of the projects you do have that very public face. Yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think this is another legacy of Roy that that is now in my DNA. I mean, he was very into publicness. I think he always thought that even if it was, sorry, you're behind the pole, I'm going to kind of come over here. Um, I hope you can see me. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, he really thought there should be no divide between academia and the general public. And he thought every single project should be valuable to the general public, should provide its basic documents to the general public. And, and um, you know, it's out of that spirit. I mean, he, in a sense, he was the first open access advocate, I think. Um, and, and that's been a passion of mine um, since then as well. Um, I think there's another reason, well, there's several other reasons to be public about your project. Um, I, I, think, I think the more your project gets out, um, and this is difficult because people are worried about criticism and, and these kinds of things, and there's a lot of politics around some, some projects, but I think it's very healthy. It's mentally healthy for lots of eyeballs to sort of descend on your project. I think it helps you in the long run. I know at the Center for History and New Media and certainly at DPLA, which is a very high profile project, I'd get my inbox would be full every morning with suggestions and complaints and ideas. And I ignored 90% of them because I'm human and I, you know, I get a lot of email. Um, but you know, 10% of them definitely impacted me and, and made me think anew about, about these sorts of things. So um, it, it also attuned me to the fact that we have a lot of artificial barriers because things are not public. So um, for instance, uh, just to stick with DPLA for a second, we often have museums as being separate than libraries. They have their own metadata, they have their own people, they have their own buildings. But it turns out, and I just really felt this through DPLA, that by, by being public and by actually publicly trying to knit collections from museums and libraries together, we had a stronger whole uh, that I was not, I frankly, and this is just, I was being dumb, but I should have realized that those institutions could in fact have a lot of commerce if they were, if there was some connective tissue um, between them. So um, we had a lot of things happen at DPLA just because we had documents that were public for the first time and then people would come to us, oh wow, I, you know, I didn't realize this stuff even existed and we've got this idea for an exhibition or, or project. So I see it as a perpetual motion machine. The more public you are, the more you will get um, unsolicited <laughs> advice that you will not appreciate, but also unsolicited um, partners who will end up being important for you for years to come. That was, that was really interesting and, and wonderful. Um, one of the things that strikes me about institutionalization is that it's sort of like schema writing in the sense that you have an opportunity to create a blueprint either based on something that you already have, right? The yeah. normalization and routinization of, of existing practices or to be kind of proleptic and out in front and to think about what kind of leadership you want the schema to exert upon yeah. the future data. And I wonder if you have thoughts about, particularly in a library context where the library traditionally isn't necessarily out in front of the research enterprise in ways that are visible to the research enterprise, although they may be visible <laughs> to the library. You know, how, how does one navigate that space in the process of institutioning something as new as digital scholarship? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, boy, you know, it's, it's hard. I think, um, so you could see in just my very brief remarks about the sort of growth of CHM, essentially we went through a process of sort of ontology, right? It was a schema. We decided like, what are we doing? Oh yeah, we have things that are sort of exhibitions and then we have things that are tools and we have things that are learning related, right? And we were sort of stumbling toward that. So what 
I think was a disadvantage to us at CHM because we were not in the library. We were, we were actually organizationally within the history department, which is a very unusual setup. Um, it allowed us to just to go back to Monica's question. It allowed us to put some hard shells around people and hard people on hard money because we were within a department that could support that. But the negative was we weren't really an open space. And so our permeability or, or you know, how much we interacted with people beyond just our um, immediate realm of history like things was poor. And so I think as part of that schema building, we probably missed out on some areas that we might have been able to, to do and have an impact. So here again, and I think it relates to Wayne's uh, question of publicness, um, you know, I think within your university being more public um, uh, and inviting people in, um, you have office hours regularly. You have at the Digital Scholarship Group at Northeastern, um, there are lots of workshops and, and, and events and talks. Doing more of that will just invite other people in depending on what the specific talk is. And at that point, you'll get some of their domain specific knowledge um, in a way that we probably were buffed a little bit at CHM. Um, and that's probably a healthy thing. Yeah. I think there's a, oh. And there's also one in the way back. Oh, yeah. I, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, I, and then and then up up here afterwards, maybe. Sorry. Thanks, yeah. I mean, AJ Turner talk from MIT libraries. Yeah. Um, so when at MIT libraries we have meetings about uh, internal library meetings about digital scholarship, what is it? How do we define it? We kind of skip that first part, the definition of it, <laughs> because it's too complicated. It's GIS, it's Python, it's R, it's this and that. Um, in your talk today, you mentioned a lot of the term you. Uh, emphasize the term affordance as in your story. Um, so I will ask you kindly to define digital scholarship <laughs> for, for us as, as a historian, you know, the history yeah. of the footnote, you're someone who's kind of worked within the team who created Zotero. Um, we know the history of the tablets from, from you know, if, if that's where it starts from the tablets, from uh, rolls into the codex form, now it's in yeah. the, there are different kinds of affordances and the impact of scholarship we do in different ways. Yeah. Um, can you please define digital scholarship for us, for God's sakes? <laughs> and with that, I have to make my train back to Boston. I uh, thank you all very much. <sighs> um, I, I'm sorry. I, I really, I'm, I'm just joking around. Um, you know, so I, I think, I, I will say, actually, as an opening gambit, that um, I do worry about, and this, this often happens in the debates over digital humanities, everyone's always asking everyone to define things and, and then they hate their definition. Um, I, I, play, I play, maybe I'm not actually playing, I, I play dumb on this question in that I do take Roy's point, which is, um, well, just sticking with digital history for a second. He saw digital history as history using digital media and technology to advance the traditional aims of history. I mean, he didn't, he didn't cloud it up. He didn't say it's GIS or it's this or that. Um, he wanted a very capacious definition for it. And I think digital scholarship, to be frank, um, I think should also have a very capacious uh, definition around it. At your particular institution, as I've just discussed, you may be really narrowed in on GIS and digital mapping because you have particular strengths and faculty interests and so forth. That's great. Um, but I think um, I, I worry about spending a lot of time um, talking about it and not enough time doing it. <laughs> Actually, when we created that camp, the, uh, the Humanities and Technology Camp at George Mason, which was a an unconference, which is going to celebrate its 10th year next year, which is hard for me to believe. There's been hundreds of these around the world. They were specifically meant to elide the um, scholarly conference, spending the first day on definitions and go straight to practical, like how do I do this and, and what kind of projects work? So people can get their feet wet in it because a lot of people who show up to that camps just have never done any of this stuff. They don't even, they don't know what GIS is. And before you can define something, I think you do have to have a kind of experiential moment with it. Um, affordances is a fancy word that I shouldn't have used. Um, I'm, uh, you know, that to understand what it can and cannot do. 
um, I think is important. So when Roy and I were, in fact, working on a definition for our book around this, what we decided on was that, um, um, and this is not to uh, disparage plumbers, which is a noble profession, as we wrote in the book, but you want to be an architect about these things. You're an architect in that you're designing a project that uses plumbing, uses affordances of this new media and its, its characteristics. And we, t we thought a lot about what the characteristics are. You know, it's, it's um, manipulable, right? You can manipulate data really easily on it. You can, it's easy to replicate things in digital media. We thought through what the characteristics are, and I'd encourage people to go back to the, just the introduction to our digital history book, which I think holds up despite all the changes. We thought through what those characteristics are, and then using those characteristics, also there were negative char characteristics, by the way. Um, using those, act like an architect to construct or design an entity that maximizes the use of those great tools. And I still think, you know, which is hard to do in 20, 2017, but I still think that the internet and digital media have a lot to recommend themselves. Clearly, they now have a lot not to recommend. Um, uh, but, but they're amazing things. I mean, they're, it's an incredible medium and with, with tremendous power if used right. And I think, again, if you think along those lines and not worry about CSS or WordPress or Omeka or, or again, any of the plumbing, but think about the architecture, I think you then can get to a point where you sort of understand what the digital scholarship is from that high level of point. Did I, did I evade your question successfully? Oh, you gave me a thumbs up. Thank you. You're very kind. Okay. Um, we have a question here. Yeah. Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott Warren from Syracuse. Thank you very much for your talk. Sure. As you spoke about growing from a one or two person shop and slowly accreting up to 60 plus people, uh, were there moments where you realized you actually, even though you were growing slowly, that you had crossed thresholds or inflection points and you had a quantum yeah. jump in capacity or maybe conversely a quantum jump in new concerns or worries yeah. for sustainability? and. And oh, at yeah. what point, size-wise, right. maybe there is no such point, but for the institutionalization of yeah. it, where you said we've crossed, we've crossed the boundary where, in some sense, we're we're too big to fail, or we're going to persist now. Yeah. So I wonder if you could speak Boy, about that. Boy, that's such a good question. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, um, what you know, and there have been studies of nonprofits that I think hold true for digital scholarship centers. So you can get up to you know, a million-ish dollars a year on grants and things like that, assuming NEH continues to exist and IMLS and so forth. You can kind of accrete a bunch of grants and maybe get to one, 1 1.5 million. Um, most studies of nonprofits have shown that there's the dangerous chasm after that point, because really then what it means is you're moving into a new realm that you can't just kind of duct tape things together and pull half an FTE from the, this programmer and so forth. If you want to get to that point that CHM got to of, you know, 50 people, 60 people, um, you know, you're, where you're, we were doing maybe three and a half, four million dollars a year, there is a big jump on that. And, and I think this again goes back to Monica's question. I think you do need to, if you have some success in that initial cobbling together phase, I think you do need some institutional support to get, let's, let's call it half of that 3 million or 4 million. You know, again, most of this is income, it's salaries of people, but you need to get that level of people. We felt really itchy in the module in the parking lot um, when we were at maybe 15 people because it seemed like we were doing a lot and everyone was working really, really hard and, you know, we only had three programmers or something, you know, it was just, it was not sustainable. I mean, it was, you know, Roy would wake up at 3 a.m. and worry about it. Um, and I mean, we would, I mean, I would wake up at 3 a.m. as well um, about these things. And I think it was after we crossed out of that dozen people, million dollar a year out to, you know, what is effectively a department. I mean, we became a kind of academic department with graduate students and with um, areas of focus. And it, it just, 
you know, we got a new space that didn't have raccoons and fleas that I showed you there at the end um, in, a, in a research building. Um, George Mason, because of, I mean, again, it had been 15 years since this thing had started, but they designated the center as one of the five spires of excellence in um, the university, which, you know, which was nice. I mean, it didn't come with cash prizes, but it, it did mean that they, they sort of understood that they wanted to keep us going because it was, people knew about George Mason in large part because of the center, or they, they knew about the center and then I'd see them at conferences and they say, well, where, where is that again? You know, I'd say, oh, it's in Northern Virginia. Um, so I think it became important to the university once we crossed out of that kind of basic threshold. Okay, well, I can see um, some people are making trains or planes or automobiles. Um, this has been a great discussion. I'm happy to answer personal questions. If you have any, um, I'll stick around. So thanks again, really appreciate it.